The king's baggage, heaped on three white painted wagons, had a dozen men at arms to guard the royal jewels, but otherwise there was only the host of women and children and a handful of page boys who were armed with short swords. The army's thousands of horses were also there, picketed close to the forest and watched by a few crippled men. Eleanor noted that most of the horses were saddled as though the men-at-arms and archers wanted the animals ready in case they had to flee. A priest had been with the royal baggage, but when the bows sounded he had hurried to the crest, and Eleanor was tempted to follow. Better to see what was going on, she thought, than wait here beside the forest and fear what might be happening. She patted the dog and stood, intending to walk to the crest, but just then she saw the woman who had come to Thomas in the damp night in the forest of Cressy. The Countess of Armorica, beautifully dressed in a red gown and with her hair netted in a silver mesh, was riding a small white mare up and down beside the prince's wagons. She paused every now and then to gaze at the crest, and then she would stare towards the forest of Cressy Grange that lay to the west. A crash startled Eleanor and made her turn to the crest. Nothing explained the terrible noise that had sounded uncannily like a close clap of thunder, but there was no lightning and no rain, and the mill stood unharmed. Then a seep of grey-white smoke showed above the mill's furled sails, and Eleanor understood that the guns had fired. Ryeballs, they were called, she remembered, and she imagined their rusting iron arrows slashing down the slope. She looked back to the countess, but Jeanette was gone. She had ridden to the forest, taking her jewels with her. Eleanor saw the red gown flash in the trees, then disappear. So the countess had fled, fearing the consequences of defeat. And Eleanor, suspecting that the prince's woman must know more of the English prospects than the archer's women, made the sign of the cross. Then, because she could not bear the waiting any longer, she walked to the crest. If her lover died, she thought, then she wanted to be near him. Other women followed her. None spoke. They just stood on the hill and watched, and prayed for their men. Thomas's second arrow was in the air before his first had reached its greatest height and begun to fall. He reached for a third, then realized he had shot the second in panic, and so he paused and stared at the clouded sky that was strangely thick with flickering black shafts that were as dense as starlings and deadlier than hawks. He could see no crossbow bolts. Then he laid the third arrow on his left hand and picked a man in the Genoese line. There was an odd pattering noise that startled him, and he looked to see it was the hail of Genoese bolts striking the turf around the horse pits. And a heartbeat later, the first English arrow flight slammed home. Scores of crossbow men were snatched backwards, including the one Thomas had picked out for his third arrow, and so he changed his aim to another man, hauled the cord back to his ear, and let the shaft fly. They're falling short, the Earl of Northampton shouted exultantly, and some of the archers swore, thinking he spoke of their own arrows, but it was the Genoese bows that had been enfeebled by the rain, and not one of their quarrels had reached the English archers, who, seeing the chance for slaughter, gave a howling cheer and ran a few paces down the slope. Kill them! Will Skeet shouted. They killed them. The great bows were drawn again and again, and the white-feathered arrows slashed down the slope to pierce mail and cloth, and to turn the lower hill into a field of death. Some crossbow men limped away, a few crawled, and the uninjured edged backwards rather than span their weapons. Aim well, the Earl called. Don't waste arrows, Will Skeet shouted. Thomas shot again, plucked a new arrow from the bag, and sought a new target as his previous arrows seared down to strike a man in the thigh. The grass about the Genoese line was thick with arrows that had missed, but more than enough were striking home. The Genoese line was thinner, much thinner, and it was silent now, except for the cries of men being struck and the moans of the wounded. The archers advanced again, right to the edge of their pits, and a new flight of steel poured down the slope. And the crossbow men fled. One moment they had been a ragged line, still thick with men, who stood behind the bodies of their comrades, and now they were a rabble, who ran as hard as they could to escape the arrows. Stop shooting! Will Skeet bellowed. Stop! Hold! John Armstrong, whose men were to the left of Skeet's band, shouted. Well done! The Earl of Northampton called. Back, lads, back! Will Skeet motioned the archers. Some, David, go and collect some arrows, quick! He pointed down the slope to where, amidst the Genoese dying and dead, the white-tipped shafts were thickly stuck in the turf, 
Hurry, lads. John, Peter, go and help them. Go! All along the line, archers were running to salvage arrows from the grass. But then a shout of warning came from the men who had remained in their places. Get back! Get back! Will Skeet shouted. The horsemen were coming. Sir Guillaume d'Eveque led a convoy of twelve men on the far left of the French second line of horsemen. Ahead of him was a mass of French cavalry belonging to the first battle. To his left was a scatter of infantrymen who sat on the grass, and beyond them the small river twisted through its water meadows beside the forest. To his right was nothing but horsemen crammed together as they waited for the crossbowmen to weaken the enemy line. That English line looked pitifully small, perhaps because its men-at-arms were on foot and so took up much less room than mounted knights. Yet Sir Guillaume grudgingly acknowledged that the English king had chosen his position well. The French knights could not assault either flank, for they were both protected by a village. They could not ride around the English right, for that was guarded by the soft lands beside the river, while to circle about Edward's left would mean a long journey around Vadicourt, and by the time the French came in sight of the English again, the archers would surely have been redeployed to meet a French force made ragged by its long detour, which meant that only a frontal assault could bring a swift victory, and that, in turn, meant riding into the arrows. Heads down, shields up, and keep close, he told his men, before clanging down the facepiece of his helmet. Then, knowing he would not charge for some time yet, he pushed the visor back up. His men-at-arms shuffled their horses till they were knee to knee. The wind, it was said, should not be able to blow between the lances of a charging convoi. Be a while yet, Sir Guillaume warned them. The fleeing crossbowmen were running up the French-held hill. Sir Guillaume had watched them advance and mouthed a silent prayer that God would be on the shoulders of the Genoese. Kill some of those damned archers, he had prayed, but spare Thomas. The drummers had been hammering their great kettles, driving down the sticks as if they could defeat the English by noise alone and Sir Guillaume, elated by the moment, had put the butt of his lance on the ground and used it to raise himself in the stirrups so he could see over the heads of the men in front. He had watched the Genoese loose their quarrels, seen the bolts as a quick haze in the sky, and then the English had shot, and their arrows were a dark smear against the green slope and grey clouds, and Sir Guillaume had watched the Genoese stagger. He had looked to see the English archers falling, but they were coming forward instead, still loosing arrows, and then the two flanks of the small English line had billowed dirty white as the guns added their missiles to the hail of arrows that was whipping down the slope. His horse had twitched uneasily when the crack of the guns rolled over the valley, and Sir Guillaume dropped into the saddle and clicked his tongue. He could not pat the horse, for the lance was in his right hand, and his left arm was strapped into its shield with the three yellow hawks on the blue ground. The Genoese had broken. At first Sir Guillaume did not credit it, believing that perhaps their commander was trying to trick the English archers into an undisciplined pursuit that would strand them at the bottom of the slope where the crossbows could turn on them. But the English did not move, and the fleeing Genoese had not stopped. They ran, leaving a thick line of dead and dying men, and now they climbed in panic towards the French horsemen. A growl sounded from the French men-at-arms. It was anger, and the sound rose to a great jeer. Cowards! a man near Sir Guillaume called. The Count of Alençon felt a surge of pure rage. They've been paid, he snarled at a companion. Bastards have taken a bribe. Cut them down, the king called from his place at the edge of the beechwood. Cut them down. His brother heard him and wanted nothing more than to obey. The Count was in the second line, not the first, but he spurred his horse into a gap between two of the leading convoi and shouted at his men to follow. Cut them down, he called. Cut the bastards down. The Genoese were between the horsemen and the English line, and now they were doomed, for all along the hill the French were spurring forward. Hot-blooded men from the second battle were tangling with the convoi of the first line to form an untidy mass of banners, lances, and horses. They should have walked their horses down the hill so that they were still in close order when they reached the climb on the far side, but instead they raked back spurs and, driven by a hatred of their own allies, raced each other to the kill. We stay, Guy Vexil, Count of Asterac, shouted at his men. Wait, Sir Guillaume called. Better to let the first ragged charge spend itself, he reckoned, 
rather than join the madness. Perhaps half the French horsemen stayed on the hill. The rest, led by the king's brother, rode down the Genoese. The crossbow men tried to escape. They ran along the valley in an attempt to reach the northern and southern ends, but the mass of horsemen overlapped them and there was no way out. Some Genoese sensibly lay down and curled into balls, others crouched in the shallow ditches, but most were killed or wounded as the horsemen rode over them. The Destriers were big beasts with hooves like hammers. They were trained to run men down, and the Genoese screamed as they were trampled or slashed. Some knights used their lances on the crossbowmen, and the weight of a horse and armored man easily drove the wooden spears clean through their victims, but those lances were all lost, left in the mangled torsos of the dead men, and the knights had to draw their swords. For a moment there was chaos in the valley bottom as the horsemen drove a thousand paths through the scattered crossbowmen. Then there were only the mangled remnants of the Genoese mercenaries, their red and green jackets soaked with blood and their weapons lying broken in the mud. The horsemen, one easy victory under their belt, cheered themselves. Montjoie Saint-Denis! They shouted, Montjoie Saint-Denis! Hundreds of flags were being taken forward with the horsemen, threatening to overtake the Oriflamme, but the red ribboned knights guarding the sacred flag spurred ahead of the charge, shouting their challenge as they started up the slope towards the English, and so climbed from a valley floor that was now thick with charging horsemen. The remaining lances were lowered, the spurs went back, but some of the more sensible men who had waited behind for the next assault noted that there was no thunder of hoofs coming from the vast charge. It's turned to mud, Sir Guillaume said to no one in particular. Trappers and surcoats were spattered with the mud churned up by the hoofs from the low ground that had been softened by the rain. For a moment the charge seemed to flounder, then the leading horsemen broke out of the wet valley bottom to find better footing on the English hill. God was with them after all, and they screamed their war cry. Montjoie Saint-Denis! The drums were beating faster than ever, and the trumpets screamed to the sky as the horses climbed towards the mill. Fools, Guy Vexil said. Poor souls, Sir Guillaume said. What's happening? The king asked, wondering why his careful ordering of the battle lines had broken even before the fight proper had begun. But no one answered him. They just watched. Jesus.